today's sermon and type your own notes. You may also save your notes to your phone or share them in a variety of ways. And finally, the giving button takes you to the Phil Street's giving portal where you may give your tithe to our general budget and give to mission, the building fund, as well as pay for events and trips. So download the app and take advantage of this new tool to stay informed and to keep in touch with us. The fabulous Blackwood Quartet will join us on Sunday, July 7th at 6 for our concert series. A love offering will be received and there will be a reception in the Family Life Center after the concert. Don't miss this evening of American Southern Gospel Music and Church Fellowship. 51 students and sponsors have been at Camp Zephyr this past week. They have enjoyed great teaching, music, and events with opportunities to build personal relationships as a group and with their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Church, for your generosity to our students through your giving and prayer. Please note that due to the 4th of July holiday, we will not have fellowship meal or prayer meeting on Wednesday, July 3rd. In addition, the church office will be closed on Thursday, July 4th. On this Sunday before July 4th, we would like to honor and recognize those who are serving in our military and those who have served in our military. So maybe as um, the choir sings, the branches, the different branches, and you have served or a family member has served, we would like you to stand so we can express our thanks and appreciation to you. All right, choir, let's stand, please.
Would you join me in prayer, please? Father, thank you for the privilege we have to gather in your house today as a portion of your people to worship you. And we acknowledge your greatness and your faithfulness, your goodness, your mercy and your grace, your sovereignty, your righteousness, and your holiness. You're so worthy of our praise. We ask, Father, that you would forgive us of our sins, that you would cleanse us even in this moment of all of our iniquity. For we realize that it is so true what the Bible says about us, that our hearts are desperately wicked. And so we pray for your forgiveness. We ask, Father, that you will make your presence known and felt in this very room, and that you will even now be tendering our hearts to receive the message that you have for us today from the scriptures. Thank you for each one who has come. We pray that you will bless our time together, and we do pray for our country, asking you to bring about a revival to your church and a spiritual awakening across this land, the likes that we have not seen in our lifetimes. We pray, Father, that we will be obedient unto you, that our commitment will be greater to you, and that we will follow you with more faithfulness, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, good morning. It's such a joy to welcome you to this time of worship here at Field Street Baptist Church. If you are a guest with us this morning, we are delighted that you've chosen to be a part of this uh, gathering. Thank you for being here. We'd love for you to let us know that you're here today. If you would like to do so, whether you are a member or, or a guest, please complete a communication card. That card is located in the pew in front of you. Take a moment uh, before the receiving of the offering. Complete this card, and later when the offering plate is passed, please uh, drop this communication card inside the offering plate. We would love to know of your presence here with us today, especially if you are our guest. Would you please rise to your feet as we take a moment now and greet one another? Thank you for being in worship today here at Field Street. We're glad to have you with us. Nice job. Wonderful fellowship this morning. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Let's sing. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grace of man is born. He has the faithful lightning of his hair. The most is one is truth. is marching on.
you may be seated.
9, 23, if you want to be my disciple, you must pick up your cross daily and follow me. As we sing this little chorus, make that commitment renewed in your heart today. I will follow you. for us today. We return this morning to the sixth chapter of the book of Revelation. Please open your Bibles with me to Revelation 6. The verses we want to look closely at this morning are found in verses 7, uh, pardon me, verses 9 through 17. In the sermon text before us this morning, the Lamb, that is Jesus Christ, opens the fifth and sixth seals. In verses 1 through 8 of chapter 6, you may recall, we read of the wrath of God. In these verses, 9 through 17, we now read what sounds like a complete contradiction, which is the wrath of the Lamb. The Lamb, in judgment, pours out His wrath and fury on a sinful unrepentant, 
rebellious humanity that has defiantly rejected his gracious offers of forgiveness, grace, and salvation. It may very well be that this particular angle of the Bible's portrayal of Christ makes us very uncomfortable. Now, why do I say that? The reason is we have been somewhat conditioned to think only of Christ as loving, meek, a gentle, compassionate, walking around, patting little kids on the head, whistling with the birds, and smiling all the time. Yet, while it is true that Christ is compassionate, that He is meek and gentle and humble in heart, and the most loving man to have ever walked the face of this earth, it is also accurate that the Bible portrays Jesus as a man who twice in righteous anger cleansed the temple, angrily condemned the hypocrisy of the scribes and Pharisees, even calling them, you recall, a brood of vipers, and said more about the eternal fire and judgment of hell than anyone else in sacred Scripture. Thus, to have a balanced view of Jesus as portrayed in the Bible, we have to strive to hold in tension His love and His holiness, His compassion and His justice, His grace and His righteousness, and His mercy and His wrath. Now furthermore, we are given a glimpse in this text as to what or who is under the altar of the throne in heaven. In verse 10, we have the question of this group of people posed to the Lord. And in a sense, this question has the gravity of a question that is one for the ages. It is a substantive question. And God's response is recorded in verse 11. In verses 12 through 14, John witnesses certain signs heralding the final day of the Lord so often alluded to and described in the Word of God. And finally, in verses 15 through 17, John describes a very palpable terror that will be experienced on the earth. So I want us to examine this text more closely and we begin by reading with verse 9 through verse 17. John writes, And when the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of all who had been martyred for the word of God and for being faithful in their witness. They called loudly to the Lord and said, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long will it be before you judge the people who belong to this world for what they have done to us? When will you avenge our blood against these people? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and they were told to rest a little longer until the full number of their brothers and sisters, their fellow servants of Jesus, had been martyred. I watched as the Lamb broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake. The sun became as dark as black cloth, and the moon became as red as blood. Then the stars of the sky fell to the earth like green figs falling from trees shaken by mighty winds. And the sky was rolled up like a scroll and taken away. And all of the mountains and all of the islands disappeared. Verse 15, Then the kings of the earth, the rulers, the generals, the wealthy people, the people with great power, and every slave and every free person all hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they cried to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who will be able to survive? To guide us in making our way through what can only be described as a very remarkable text of Scripture. I'd like for us to organize our thinking in this way. And there are five key words. The first word is the cry in verse 10. The second word in verse 9 is the cause. 
in verse 9 again, the costliness. And number 4, in verses 12 through 14, the cosmos. And finally, in verses 15 through 17, the consequence. Now look back at verse 10. And we have the cry. They called loudly to the Lord and said, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long will it be before you judge the people who belong to this world for what they have done to us? When will you avenge our blood against these people? Now the plural pronoun they refers back to those who are under the altar in verse 9. You recall that this altar is known as the altar of incense. The identities of those under the altar are clearly stated in verse 9. They are, according to the text, those who had been slain or martyred for the word of God and for being faithful in their witness. Now, one of the commentators I consulted stated that the fifth seal then is known as the martyr's seal. Uh, Thus the Lamb opens the fifth seal and the scroll reveals an altar together with souls who have been slain under that altar. Now it's it's a challenge somewhat to identify these martyrs. Who are they? Are they those who represent all those who are martyred during the entire history of the church or even all the dead saints of God? It would seem that based on the context... Perhaps the best explanation would be that the martyrs here are those who are killed during the tribulation period. Of course, it could also be those who gave their lives and faithfulness to God and the gospel. Whoever they are, they cry out to the Lord in verse 10. And that's unmistakable. O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long will it be before you judge the people who belong to this world for what they have done to us? When will you avenge our blood against these people? Wow. That's a remarkable question. This is plain and simple. A call for vengeance. Now, how do we reconcile Such a cry of vengeance or for vengeance with teaching in the scripture that would instruct us to resist the urge to seek revenge and to avoid the desire to retaliate. These saints are practicing Romans 12, 19. Romans 12, 19 states, Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. Now this cry sounds more like what we would call an imprecatory prayer that we would read in the Psalms in the Old Testament. An imprecatory psalm contains curses or prayers for the punishment of the psalmist's enemies. A psalm of this nature would contain prayers for God's judgment to fall upon the psalmist's enemies. And though we are forbidden to take revenge, we trust that God will vindicate His people by punishing those who killed them. Uh, Their question is one of timing, is it not? They are assured of God's reckoning, God's retribution, and God's punishment. The question is, O sovereign Lord, how long? Verse 11 informs us, by the way, look at that verse, that these martyrs, each of them, they are given a white robe as evidence of their righteousness, purity, and victory before the judge. And they are then told to wait a little while longer while the the full number of their brothers and sisters, their fellow servants of Christ, had been martyred. Let me ask you this. Have you ever found yourself crying out to God in this fashion? Have you ever found yourself saying, How long, O sovereign Lord, before you judge the wicked and the rebellious, the perpetrators of such vile evil, those who who slaughter your people, how long indeed? That is their cry. Now notice in verse 9, the cause for the martyrs' deaths. 
And when the Lamb broke the fifth seal, this is verse 9, I saw under the altar the souls of all who had been martyred for the Word of God and for being faithful in their witness. Now, what was the cause for those who had been martyred? Why were these saints martyred? The reason for their loss of life is clearly set forth in verse 9. And the reason, the Word of God and the testimony they had faithfully maintained. In other words, for their commitment to declare the gospel and live the gospel, they paid for that commitment with their very lives. Now, one man I read wrote this, and I'll just be very forthright with you about this. This is going to be extremely hard to hear. He wrote this. He said, every believer in Christ ought to be prepared for martyrdom. For Christians cannot express their priestly communion with their Lord more perfectly than when they accept the suffering and glory of martyrdom. With that said, let's be real, real honest with ourselves for just a moment. And I'm going to stomp all over your toes because I've already stomped all over mine and they hurt. I want you to join in the pain. So let's be really honest for a moment. Many modern Western Christians think they are doing God a favor when they manage to show up one Sunday out of four. And these are the same people that never miss a football game, never miss a soccer game, a baseball game, a gymnastics meet. But Sunday morning, when it rolls around during the week, it appears that Sunday morning, coming to the Lord's house on the Lord's day, gathering with the Lord's people around the the Lord's Word, it's on the optional side. Many modern Christians, they can't even show up to church on time, but they would rarely be late for work, a hair appointment, or a movie. Instead of Sunday being the Lord's Day, for far too many, Sunday is a day to sleep in, relax, and recover from a brutal, demanding, busy week. Furthermore, many Christians think that they have made enormous sacrifices for the Lord when they give Him a tip of their income. And they pat themselves on the back when they throw a few dollars in the offering plate. There's no self-denial, only the indulging of self. Many Christians are just simply annoyed with minor inconveniences when it comes to their experience with Christ. I'm being encouraged almost on a weekly basis by somebody. Pastor, you need to lead the church to accommodate the whims of the varying generations so that we can remain relevant. (laughs) It appears that simply loving Jesus and loving His Word and being with His people are no longer enough to get people to participate in the life of the church. So when we read in the Bible about those who are killed because of their commitment to the Word of God and living for Christ as a faithful witness, I might as well be speaking a foreign language here in the western United States. We can't even be inconvenienced much less give our lives and martyrdom for the cause of Christ. All of us, myself included, should surely be ashamed. My friend, I want to ask you this morning, and you better inquire of yourself, what has captured your heart? Is it Christ or is it any and everything else? There are those who have and will give their lives for King Christ. Incredibly, it appears in Scripture, it is a very precious fraternity. Now look with me at verse 9, and we see the costliness. Again in verse 9, and particularly the latter part, And when the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of all who had been martyred for the Word of God and for being faithful in their witness. Not only was there a cause to which these martyrs were committed, but that commitment was costly. 
What did their commitment to the Word of God and to, the, to their faithful witness for Christ cost them? The text says, their very lives. Now I want to ask you, and I've been asking myself this too, so I'm not just picking on, on you, I'm picking on myself first and foremost, but what does your commitment to Jesus Christ and His kingdom, what does it really cost you? What do you give up to follow Jesus? What do you go without to follow Jesus? What comforts do you or are you willing to forsake to follow Christ? What do you deny yourself to follow Jesus? Did you know 56 men signed the Declaration of Independence? Their conviction resulted in untold sufferings for themselves and their families. Of the 56 men, five were captured by the British and tortured before they died. Twelve had their homes ransacked and burned. Two lost their sons in the Revolutionary Army. Another had two sons captured. Nine of the 56 fought and died from wounds or hardships of the war. Carter Braxton of Virginia, a wealthy planter and trader, saw his ships sunk by the British Navy. He sold his home and all of his property to pay his debts and died in poverty. At the Battle of Yorktown, the British general, Cornwallis, had taken over Thomas Nelson's home for his headquarters. Nelson quietly ordered General George Washington to open fire on the Nelson home. The home was destroyed and Nelson died bankrupt. John Hart was driven from his wife's bedside as she was dying. Their 13 children fled for their lives. His fields and his mill were destroyed for over a year. He lived in the forest and in caves, returning home only to find that his wife was dead and his children were nowhere to be found. A few weeks later, he died from exhaustion. I can assure you this, that if you are serious about following Christ, then it's going to cost you something. It may cost you time, it may cost you money, it may cost you effort, it may cost you a few friends, it may cost you ridicule, it may cost that you will be misunderstood, and so forth. I'm very challenged in my own life by what King David once said. He said, I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. And a lot of Christians, a lot of people who do attend church want to have a relationship with Christ, but they don't want it to cost them anything. Look at verses 12 through 14. We have here the cosmos. John says, I, I watched as the Lamb broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake. The sun became as dark as black cloth, and the moon became as red as blood. Then the stars of the sky fell to the earth like green figs falling from trees shaken by mighty winds. And the sky was rolled up like a scroll and taken away, and all of the mountains and all of the islands disappeared. Now in verse 12, the sixth seal is broken by the Lamb. This is the seal of the day of the Lord when judgment falls on the unbelieving. And under the sovereign control and direction of Christ, what happens next is just cosmic upheaval. Now to be certain, there are some fine, uh, well-educated students of the Bible who view these judgments as symbolic, uh, say of political or, or social upheaval. Yet the Bible repeatedly indicates that such happenings will take place when our Lord draws history to a close. A violent earthquake occurs. And earthquakes, as you know, often accompany a divine visitation in Scripture. The cosmic upheavals also impairs the light of the sun so that it is darkened like a dark cloth made from goat's hair and worn in times of mourning. Notice uh, the moon is affected and, and appears like the deep red color of blood. And furthermore, the, the Bible says that stars fall from the sky to the earth. The word translated stars simply refers here to any celestial body, large or small, having the appearance of a star. 
Look at verse, verse 14. Uh, this is difficult to understand, but whatever this describes, we can only speculate. But make no mistake, there is a total cosmic meltdown. And that brings us finally to the consequence that we see recorded in verses 15 through 17. Listen to this. Then the kings of the earth, the rulers, the generals, the wealthy people, the people with great power and every slave and every free person all hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they cried to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us! And hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne, God, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who will be able to survive? What this means is that the nature of God's judgment is comprehensive. No one will escape. No one will be excluded or secluded. Those who who have managed to receive special treatment and status here on earth will get none of that. On this dreadful day, all worldly status and privilege will not matter a single iota. Every king, every authority, every person of power, the wealthy, the poor, the slave and free will all have business with the righteous lamb on that day. No one gets a pass. All must give account. And the Bible says there will be no place to hide. You would think that all of these phenomena, everything that is foretold here in the Scripture, that everything that is going to happen would drive people to repentance and to fall on their knees before King Christ and beg for His forgiveness. But it doesn't. Tragically, there's no repentance, there's no sorrow, there's no brokenness over sin. What we see here is that faced with the dread of God's judgment, people plead for death. Look at verse 16. People plead for the mountains and the rocks to fall in on them and hide them from God and from Christ. Consequently, people would foolishly rather die than repent and have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. There will be no place to hide, no place to run, and you cannot escape the Omnipotent One. Finally, verse 17 informs us that the great day of wrath has come. And the question in verse 10 was, you recall, Sovereign Lord, how long? The question now presented in verse 17 is, who will be able to survive? Who can stand? Now that is another question for the ages. Who can stand? So my question to you this morning, what will be your experience? Will you recognize your great need for Christ, for forgiveness, for the grace of God to fall upon you through Jesus? And will you repent of your sin and put your faith in Him for salvation? Or will you go right on doing what you're doing now, living only for yourself with no realization of what is coming? The Bible has warned us so clearly. What will you experience, forgiveness or condemnation? My question for you as I close is, how long will you wait before you settle this issue with your Lord? I plead with you, come to Him for salvation. Would you bow your head with me, please? Our Father in heaven, we acknowledge your, sovereign, your sovereignty that you are true and holy and that you reign supreme over all things. In your love for us, not only did you send Christ to this world so that the world through Him might be saved, but you've given us your word to warn us, to alarm us, to cause us to look to you for our salvation. Sadly, so many are just 
going on with their days, living their lives, enjoying themselves without even a thought for eternity. How sad. But I pray in these moments, Father, that those who are gathered in this room and others who are listening by our live stream will feel compelled to think seriously about matters of eternity. And so I pray for even one person present this morning or listening that today would be the day of salvation to your glory and for their good. That today would be the day of repentance and faith placed in Christ Jesus for salvation. I pray that in these few moments of response that we would honestly respond to you as you would most desire. I ask this in Christ's name. Amen. In just a moment, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet and we're going to extend what we call an invitation. It's just simply a few moments at the end of the time of sharing the Word of God where you have the opportunity to respond. And my great prayer and hope is that if you're not a follower of Christ yet, that today your response would be to seek the forgiveness of God and by faith put your confidence in Christ to save you that He might be your Savior. Now, I recognize, I look across the room today, there are many who profess faith in Christ. and You're already following Jesus. So what should you do? Well, I would suggest that right where you stand, that you'd ask God to give you a greater commitment to Him. And you'd ask Him, what, is it, what should it cost me to follow you? And are you willing to pay such a cost? I don't know what your response needs to be. I've been dealing with what my own response should be. Troubling. <laughs> For sure. This is not an easy question to to pose to the Lord. Maybe others of you would come this morning uniting with our church. Whatever you need to do, my hope is that you will be responsive. I'll be standing here at the front to receive any that might feel compelled to come in a public way. Others of you, if not most, I recognize your response will be right where you're standing. We want to give you a few moments for you to respond to however the Lord has spoken to you through this worship service, and especially through the Scriptures. Would you rise to your feet as we extend this invitation? You come as we sing. Living for Jesus, a life that is true. Striving to please Him in all that I do. Yielding allegiance, glad Thank you. Please be seated for just a few moments more. Our ushers are making their way forward as we prepare to receive this morning's offering. Would you join with me in prayer? Father, thank you for the privilege to be in your house, uh, to be with a portion of your people, to gather around your word. Uh, thank you so much for the power of the scriptures. And I pray, Father, that your word with your spirit will continue to be at work in us that we might be conformed to the very image of Christ. Bless the receiving of this offering, I ask in Christ's name, amen.
Thank you, Dr. Joe and Suzanne. Uh, I have just a few minutes before it's straight up noon, so I'd like to take care of two housekeeping matters that are very important. Number one, uh, I need a show of hands, and I would prefer that you be very honest, even if it hurts our feelings. Uh, how many of you actually have in your hand, or at least close to you, a copy of this morning's worship bulletin? Excellent. How many of you have actually read it this morning? Now, how many of you are being honest? Okay, thank you. We just added a few more there. Uh, the reason I'm asking is we're trying to determine in the church office what is the most effective means to get in information to the church body. And we've had some vigorous uh, dialogues about what's the best mode of delivering information because our fundamental conviction and philosophy is that the better informed you are, hopefully it'll translate into being more involved into the life and ministry of the church. So we're curious in part as to how effective the worship guide is in getting information at least in front of you. Now what you do with that is another thing, but at least in front of you. So as we rolled out today on the announcement video, you now have access to the Field Street app, which is another means of getting communication. A young mother today shared with me that, hey, the best way to get communication to me is a daily text from uh, Field Street Baptist Church. I'm like, wow, daily text. How about that? So we're just trying to determine what ways are most effective to get information to the church family. So I'm delighted that you're still uh, making good use of the worship bulletin because we put a lot of time and energy and effort into putting together a piece of information that's attractive and also informative and useful. And I know your favorite part, of course, is my column called Pastor's Points. And uh, please don't raise your hand if you, that's not your thing. But thank you, Michael. But uh, I know many of you cut this out and put it on your refrigerator or in your kitchen and uh, walk by it and read it every week. But hopefully you're, you're reading what we're putting into print. And we're just trying to determine. So thank you for your show of hands. I appreciate that, that very much. Secondly, uh, today as a church family, we observe and celebrate uh, the first anniversary of our Minister of Music, Billy Woods. I, for one, I'm sure you would echo this. I really appreciate your ministry among us. You are a very skilled minister of music. And uh, we are blessed to have you and your family as part of our church family. And thank you for your leadership each week in worship. You do a superb job in uh, creating an environment where we can worship the Lord through music. And thank you so much. We appreciate you, Billy, very much. Yeah. Would you please stand to your feet? I hope that at some point this week that you will take the time to express to Billy and his family, Amber and Luke Paul, and the little girl on the way, uh, how much you appreciate their ministry in our midst. It's uh, a simple thing, wouldn't take you a lot of time, but I know it'll mean a lot to them. Let's pray together. We're grateful to you, Lord, for the, the joy of being uh, together as a church family. And we pray, Father, that you will give us a strength and courage that is necessary for the day in which we live, that we will faithfully and courageously live uh, our convictions that are informed by your word and that were perfectly lived out by our Savior. So as we depart from this place, we ask that we might go in the power of the Holy Spirit to live lives that are worthy of this high calling. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You are dismissed. Uh -huh.